Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. Even before the Soviet Union ultimately collapsed back in 1991, ethnic fault lines in the southern Caucasus were already starting to unravel. Azerbaijan and Armenia would fight in a brutal six-year war. The conflict came to an uneasy pause in 1994 with Armenia's occupation of the Nagorno-Karabakh region, which is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan. Now the two countries are at war once again in the the worst fighting since their fragile truce was signed. Haider Abbasi has more. The war machine is in full gear. Azerbaijan's military pounds Armenian targets from the ground and the air. These strikes are met with attacks from Armenia. Days of fighting have killed at least 100 people and wounded more. The dead include soldiers and civilians from both sides. It's not clear how the latest hostilities over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh began. And the world is watching. The UN Security Council has called for an immediate end to the fighting. It's also demanded the parties sit down for negotiations. But it seems the neighbors are in no mood for talking. Skirmishes between Azerbaijan and Armenia aren't rare. Yet this latest flare-up is the worst between the rivals for decades. And it all centers on Nagorno-Karabakh. The area falls within Azerbaijan's borders. War broke out in 1988 after an Armenian militia tried to seize the region. Following a ceasefire in 1994, Nagorno-Karabakh stayed under Armenian control. At least 30,000 people were killed in that conflict and more than a million displaced. Although the leaders of Nagorno-Karabakh declared independence, it's not recognized as a state by any country. The UN agrees that Karabakh is occupied and is land that must be returned to Azerbaijan. At the moment, there's no sign of either side laying down its arms. The war only seems to be intensifying. These men in Azerbaijan are volunteering to fight in the military. Many of them weren't even born when Nagorno-Karabakh was lost to Armenian forces. I hope we go and make it back. Let's come back with good news. I love all our people. Be strong. The fear now is that the fighting could expand beyond the enclave and into other territories of Armenia and Azerbaijan. The international community wants to prevent that. And it's now asking, how can the years-long stalemate finally come to an end? Haider Abbasi, Straight Talk. And joining me now from Washington, D.C. is Elin Suleymanov, who is the Azerbaijani ambassador to the United States, and from Istanbul, Matthew Bryza, who is the former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Ambassador Elin, where is this fighting headed and where does your country stand amid the crisis? Uh, good, mo uh, good morning. It's good morning in Washington. So, well, the fighting still continues, and uh, Azerbaijan has always said that our main goal is to end the illegal occupation of Azerbaijani lands by Armenian forces. We do it because we believe that the lasting peace can only be found as a result of the end of this occupation. And so, this will end when uh, the fighting will end, of course, and we want to have a negotiations, a substantive talks, which will be aimed at ending this uh, occupation and this conflict. But for that, there needs to be a commitment from the Armenian side to begin the withdrawal of Armenian troops as demanded by the relevant UN Security Council resolutions and international law. Okay, do you believe that Armenia will come to the negotiations table? Uh, I don't know. I hope so. But over the last uh, couple of years, the Armenian leadership has shown 
every indication and made every move to make sure that the negotiations are undermined, that the peace process is interrupted, and every single achievement which was uh, elaborated by the international community, including the Minsk group over the last 20 plus years, has been undermined and rejected by the Armenian side. I mean, just think about this. Uh, Prime Minister of Armenia says, uh, Karabakh is Armenia, and that's it. And once he says that, what's there to negotiate? So I think, uh, and I do hope, I do hope that they come back to negotiations. That's important. So after flare-ups in July in Tovus, uh, Matthew, which isn't a, a, even a disputed region, what's the significant of, uh, significance of these clashes? What could you tell us about the timing and side's determination um, not to stand down? Sure. I mean, it's, you know, in my experience, having been not, not just the U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, but I was the U.S. mediator of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict for three years, uh, the U.S. co-chair of the Minsk group. This, so this is the by far the most serious fighting and the lowest point uh, in the relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan since, since the 1994 ceasefire. Um, the reason why it happened now, I believe, is is what Ambassador Suleimanov was getting at. I mean, I, you know, we're supposed to be, and I was impartial as a mediator. Um, impartiality, though, doesn't mean being equal in a false way. Mm -hmm. um, Armenia is in breach of international law, and its leader has done what Ambassador Suleimanov said over the course of the past year, at least. It, it has abandoned the fr framework that had been negotiated for 14 or 15 years and even preliminarily agreed by the then president of Armenia, Serge Sarkisian, and current president Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, he's just, he's given up on the negotiating process. So, um, Ambassador Elin, how is the U.S. administration reacting to the, uh, this crisis? U.S. presidential candidate Joe, Joe Biden asked the Trump administration to call on leaders of Azerbaijan and Armenia to end hostilities and also um, demand others like Turkey to stay out of this conflict. Why do you think Biden is so uneasy about Turkey's support for Azerbaijan? I think that two, we're facing two things. Uh, one is the U.S. administration in general, and most American politicians have a voice support for immediate cessation of hostilities and the return to negotiations, substantive negotiations. I want to emphasize that that's an important message coming from uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and the, and the Trump administration. Uh, why, former VIP, Biden mentioned the role of Turkey, but in the previous uh, more official statement, he actually mentioned the role of Russia as well. I, uh, it was a tweet in which he mentioned Turkey, so we have to be a little bit careful not to uh, attach too much attention to the tweet rather than official statements. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a certain, uh, there is a certain uh, campaign which tries to cast Turkey as the problem here, while we all know that the main problem is Armenia's occupation of Azerbaijani land. Turkey is not involved in this conflict. We all know those President Ali stated it very clearly. Uh, Turkey is not a party to this conflict. So and why Turkey do you think why do you think ground. some leaders pointing the finger on Turkey, especially Francis Macron? Because it's convenient. Because uh, because it is convenient. Because this is a way to cover up and to distract attention from the ongoing occupation and the war crimes committed by Armenian uh, leaders. In fact, uh, this doesn't help Armenia at all. It doesn't help Armenian people because at the end of the day, they're also on the receiving side of all this conflict. So I would, uh, it's not surprising. It's, you know, it's actually a very old uh, Soviet technique called the uh, propaganda, Bolshevik propaganda thing, where you just throw in certain uh, falsehoods there and then ask people to wait for people to get back and they get distracted by all this. It's same with this uh, allegations about Turkey shooting down the plane and then about Turkey uh, recruiting some fighters to, from Syria. All of these things are complete falsehoods. They're easily disproven. And there are radars, there's inf enough information on the ground, the sure. satellite images. They all disprove that. So in the 21st century, uh, to keep repeating these lies of a desperate uh, Armenian government, which doesn't know how to justify its own failures to the people, it's, it's just la laughable. So, um, Matthew, has Nagorno-Karabakh become the third flashpoint after Syria and Libya, where Turkey and Russia have found themselves uh, in, on the opposite sides of a conflict? And how do you think this latest crisis will affect the two country relations? I don't think it's gotten there yet. Um, Russia has been very restrained in its statements. 
Remarkably so when you consider that Armenia is a treaty ally of Russia under the Collective Security Treaty Organization. What Russia has done up until now is call on both sides, n not the opponent of its ally, but both sides uh, to stop the fighting. And, and I, this is a very significant point, the next one as well. Uh, in the joint statement of President Putin, President Trump and President Macron yesterday, um, all three called on the resumption of negotiations with no preconditions. It's only Armenia that is applying preconditions to going back to negotiations. So, so Putin is actually leaning very hard on Armenia. So because of that, uh, I think that, and because of how effectively Turkey has fought uh, against the Russians in Syria and in Libya, I think President Putin is steering clear of a confrontation with Turkey. Now, Turkey doesn't have troops fighting on the ground, so you know it, this may be this could be a diplomatic flashpoint, but I don't see it becoming a military flashpoint between Russia and Turkey. Ambassador Elin, do you believe that that's why Russia has not yet thrown its full support to Armenia? And what's actually Moscow's stance towards the Yerevan government, especially the uh, prime minister? I cannot comment on the Moscow's view of the official Yerevan at the moment. But what I can say that we have been somewhat surprised by the ongoing supplies of Russian uh, military equipment to Armenia over the last uh, over the last couple of months, including over the territory of Iran, our neighbor. We have a very good neighborly relations with the Russian Federation. We are partners in many uh, on many areas. So. In reality, I think our Russian friends understand that Azerbaijan is fighting on its own territory. This is the most fundamental point. Azerbaijan has not crossed any international border. We're fighting within our internationally recognized territories, trying to restore our territorial integrity and protect our own people and our, uh, protect our civilians. The Russians understand that we do not plan to attack Armenia. President Aliyev clearly stated we have no military goals on the ob objectives on Armenian territory. So therefore, the treaty obligations uh, which Russia has with I mean, do not apply. Now, I, I don't think there is a significant confrontation between Russia uh, and uh, Turkey. I know there was a discussion, diplomatic discussion. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Matthew said, Turkey is not involved on, in the ground. I don't like, actually, as an Azerbaijani citizen, I, I represent an independent nation. We have a very well-trained army. You could see that they're doing very well. This is not 1990s. Uh, all these years, Azerbaijan has developed a viable, quite strong state. So why why keep accusing and minimizing what Azerbaijan is doing? They're our soldiers. They're our citizens. We have overwhelming support for, for uh, the liberation of our territories and for defense of our civilians from the society. It's, it's unified. So I don't know why this is becoming this uh, rumor mill which keeps going on and on. And if I may, there's one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, as you rightly said, in July, there was a clearly a cross-border attack, a, a cross-international border in Tovuz. And that was a clear violation of all accepted behavior. But uh, you also mentioned that the territory is disputed. Nagorno-Karabakh and surrounding areas are not disputed territories. They're internationally Occupied. absolutely rec recognized as part of Azerbaijan. So... Uh, they are occupied, but the status of these territories is not a uh, dispute. So, um, Matthew, with both countries engaged, as we said, in their deadliest dispute in decades, the international community is now struggling to uh, address the crisis. How concerned you believe Western countries are and what kind of a threat those incidents pose on, for example, Europe's energy security? Well start with the last point. I mean, the pipelines and the other infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, whether digital or road or rail that go through Azerbaijan uh, are relatively removed from, from where the fighting is now. Uh, and, you know, the way pipeline security works is that were the pipelines to be damaged, they can be repaired very quickly uh, as long as uh, a hostile force doesn't seize the territory through which they run. And there's no chance of Armenia seizing that Azerbaijani territory. So I'm not worried about that. Um, and I'm not really so worried about this uh, uh, general conflagration. I mean, Elin can only go so far in, in saying what Azerbaijan's war aims are, uh, or, or you know, military operational aims are. In my opinion, what I think Azerbaijan is going to end up doing is a, a more limited operation than some people fear. I would mm -hmm. guess Azerbaijan is going to recover just some territory that is significant to enable Azerbaijani people to return to their homes mm -hmm. uh, and then prepare for the future, for the next round of negotiations from a stronger bargaining position. Yeah, we're running out of time, but Ambassador Elin, what's the end game for Azerbaijan? 
end game for Azerbaijan is to, pursue, to ensure peace and security for the entire region. First of all, of course, for our own people, but also for the region, including the people of Armenia and the Republic of Armenia. This is only, only is possible to liberation of Azerbaijan territories and the end of this occupation. This occupation does not only hurt Azerbaijan, it doesn't just displace our people. It has also uh, resulted in complete isolation uh, of Armenia, which has become a failed state. And therefore, it's, it's become a belligerent state. So as long as we do uh, achieve an uh, end to this uh, occupation, the better it is for the entire region. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Fifteen years ago, Turkey and the European Union took a bold move to redefine their relations and the European community as a whole. Official talks to bring Turkey formally into the EU began back in 2005. Hopes were high in the beginning, but a series of key differences and external factors hampered the talks. The latest hurdle to relations has been ongoing tensions in the eastern Mediterranean and control over its vast energy reserves. Those tensions were front and center at a special European Council meeting in Brussels. EU officials there warned that it could impose sanctions on Turkey if tensions continue. But the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen hinted the EU wants a positive and constructive relationship with Ankara. Tensions have flared in the eastern Mediterranean over a series of overlapping maritime claims. Turkey says dialogue should be held to ensure the area's resources are shared in an equitable and a fair manner. So, will these latest tensions be solved? And 15 years on, is Turkey's chance to join the EU all but finished? And what could have been done differently to have avoided this drawn-out stalemate? And joining me now from Brussels is Laura Batala Adam, who is the Secretary General of the European Parliament Turkey Forum. And from Istanbul, Mehmet Çelik, who is the Managing Editor at Daily Sabah. Laura, Mehmet, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. So 15 years on since the start of Turkey-EU accession talks in 2005, Laura, where do you think the relations stand? Are they at their lowest point given the latest tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean? We could say so. We, we could say that relations have uh, touched rock bottom already a few years ago, uh, but now uh, the increase of tensions in the region is making uh, dialogue uh, more difficult. But we, we, it has always been a bumpy road, so this is not the first crisis that we need to overcome in our relations, and uh, dialogue uh, prevails in most of the, in the, of the cases like we have seen as the outcome of the uh, Council meeting last night. So this is this opens the door as well to uh, engaging more in dialogue and hopefully uh, if there will be a solution to find to all these pending issues in our relations. Mm. Mehmet, despite tireless efforts by Ankara to become a full member, as just we have mentioned, recent years have revealed serious d d disagreements and obstacles in relations. Which incident you believe hurt their relations the most? Well, I don't think we can actually narrow it down to one single issue. But I think the, the fact that Turkey and the EU uh, leadership stand on different level when it comes to several things, For one of them being, as the most recent issue, the, the Eastern Mediterranean issue. Mm -hmm. But we can go back to how Turkey and EU um, stands and have different definitions of anti-terror uh, approach, for example. Mm -hmm. This is one issue. The, the refugee crisis is another issue. Um, uh, you know, Islamophobia is another issue. Uh, the, the, you know, rights and freedoms is another issue that Turkey and the EU stands on different levels. But, but I think even when we are talking about dialogue, what we mean by dialogue is different uh, when, you know, whether you're looking at it from Ankara or you're looking at it from the Brussels, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with Yesterday's, uh, yesterday's statements, for example, coming from uh, uh, the EU with regards to dialogue is different than what Turkey understands from dialogue. Mm. I mean, a dialogue pushed by, pushed by uh, uh, you know, Brussels with solely taking into consideration uh, the Greek Cypriots' uh, uh, position 
is not something that Ankara considers as dialogue, for example. So uh, European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen said we have a toolbox that we can apply immediately if uh, Turkey ended, for example, its activities in the Eastern Mediterranean. Laura, what instruments should be em employed to deal with the situation and what does it mean for Turkey to seize its activities in the Eastern Mediterranean? Well, we see how the Council uh, has adopted uh, a balance between carrots and, and sticks, which uh, it took some time to come out with this with this outcome. We we saw how different drafts were circulated uh, throughout the night, and and this uh, final one was not easy to achieve. But it indeed opens the door to a more positive political agenda on mm -hmm. certain issues. But those issues were already on the table before when uh, the EU and Turkey were negotiating the, the so-called migration deal. Uh, and they have been, it hasn't been possible to realize some of these goals. So we have to be as well realistic. Uh, it has been said there are a number of stumbling blocks in our relationship uh, that we need to address from fundamental rights and freedoms to rule of law. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not only these regional tensions now, but indeed what the Commission, what the Council is saying, that if there's uh, positive progress on uh, on de-escalating the tensions and finding solutions to these uh, maritime issues, there would be a way to achieve some of these uh, demands that Turkey has been put on, putting on the table, like customs union or visa liberalization. Yes. So hopefully we will achieve an understanding on this. So, Mehmet, how do you think uh, President Erdogan's uh, recent letter to the EU uh, leaders reiterating Ankara's call for dialogue with Greece uh, without any preconditions has played out? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the sense of or the willingness to, to, to establish some sort of platform for dialogue is there from Turkey and also the EU leadership However, um, uh, you know, what, how the Greek uh, Cypriots and Greece's position will be with regards to this dialogue approach or the constructive dialogue approach will matter. Uh, President Erdogan and Ankara or, or Turkish leadership has always been for that dialogue with, and, and they have been saying we are ready to sit down and discuss our issues uh, uh, without any yes. conditions. But if there will be a condition set up um, to, to basically, uh, you know, uh, these conditions may act as an obstacle to establish some sort of platform for a dialogue. And I think all these need to be put aside and the dialogue platform should be established. The sides should come together and then discuss. And, and I think that will be some sort of, uh, you know, first point or the baby steps to, to establish yes. and, and to get somewhere with President Erdogan's uh, letter uh, or the EU willingness to... Uh, establish some sort of uh, dialogue. So, Laura, although talks have been at a stalemate for several years, as we've just mentioned, neither side has formally tried to end this special relationship, let's say. Does that give you hope that maybe if relations can get back on the track, the accession talks as well? Well, this would be a far-fledged no. thought, I would say. Accession talks have been uh, frozen for, for many, many years now, but uh, there's a need and no one has pulled the plug. And we, we are expecting next week uh, the report by the European Commission on the progress achieved by Turkey when it comes to, to accession. So in this regard, no door has been closed. And uh, I think uh, we, we need to engage Turkey even more in our, all of the spheres of our dialogue. That includes as well now foreign policy issues, as we have seen that we need to have a more cooperative uh, collaboration with Turkey. So the, the door is not closed and, uh, and the Commission continues to state this and the member states Turkey remains a candid country and we need to uh, align more in all the areas that are causing some tension at the moment. All right. Unfortunately, Laura Mehmet, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subarkash. If you've got any comments, follow us and tweet us at Straight Talk TRT. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.